Hi, I'm Emma Varvalukas, Executive Director of the Progress Network. Uh, we're answering the urgent needs of our time by bringing together constructive public voices. You can find out more about us at theprogressnetwork.org. Um, one of those voices, he's a Progress Network member, is Steven Pinker. Uh, for many of you, he might not need an introduction. Uh, he's a linguist and a cognitive scientist who teaches at Harvard. Um, and he's very linked in the public consciousness with his most recent book, Enlightenment Now, which tracks the sort of incredible progress that humanity has, has made across the world um, and argues that enlightenment ideals are the reason why we've made so much progress. Um, and uh, the book really talks about how we ended up in this great place that we're in now, or maybe this better place that we're in now. Um, and if that sounds a bit foreign to you um, or, or wrong, stick with us. We're going to talk about it. Uh, so, Stephen, thanks so much for being with us. Welcome. Oh, it's a pleasure. Thanks. Yeah. So, um, you know, I just mentioned uh, your most recent book, Enlightenment Now, um, which is a heavily researched, uh, almost 500 page book with lots of data uh, about how we are happier, healthier, safer um, than we were in most of human history. Uh, that book came out in early 2018. Uh, now we're in 2020, hasn't exactly been a banner year. <laughs> and um, I'm sure you've been asked this question a lot, but I'm gonna ask it again. How does 2020 fit into this overall story of progress that you chose to tell a couple of years ago? Well, most things are going to get worse, uh, at least uh, certainly longevity, health, prosperity. Um, uh, not everything. I don't think the uh, progress that we made toward um, racial and sexual uh, equality will be derailed. But anything that depends on our wealth, material well-being directly uh, has to be. And what it, what it tells us is, <laughs> what it reminds us is that progress is not an escalator. It's not some mystical process that carries us ever upward. Those ideas were popular in the 19th century, but um, quite the contrary, the universe doesn't care about us. Uh, some aspects of the universe have it in for us, like germs. <laughs> uh, they are to kill us. Uh, we are big, yummy hunks of chocolate cake from, from a germ's eye point of view. <laughs> uh, we always have been, all organisms are. That's why we evolved immune systems. That's why we evolved sexual reproduction. That's why we evolved the emotion of disgust because germ pathogens and parasites have uh, always been part of the human condition, or at least uh, especially since the dawn of civilization. Uh, the difference is that now we have uh, an additional tool with which to fight back, and that is our uh, reason and our science. We can outsmart germs as opposed to uh, just trying to uh, keep one step ahead of them with our immune systems. Yeah, I mean, and you know, I think the story of sort of the acute suffering and the despair, um, people know that story about the pandemic, uh, but there is kind of this other story that, uh, you know, Max over at Our World and Data has talked about um, and that you referenced just now in terms of we have other tools to fight back. You know, can you talk a little bit more about that and, and how the place we're in now is different than the place that we've been in for most of human history when we're, we're talking about uh, fighting against germs and viruses and the like? Uh, yes, so starting from the beginning, just the fact that within days the cause of the uh, growing epidemic was uh, correctly identified as a coronavirus, uh, right away we are ahead of our ancestors who might have blamed it on divine retribution, on evil spirits, on an imbalance of humors, on wells poisoned by the Jews, on foul smelling miasmas and all kinds of uh, crackpot theories. Now, which is not to say that those crackpot theories aren't out there. We have the theory that it's caused by 5G cell phone towers and it's a plot by Bill Gates. But fortunately, those are not the, um, don't guide the policies of any governments or major institutions. <clears throat> so to begin with, we correctly identified the cause. The um, genome was sequenced within, uh, within weeks. The, uh, first defense, namely social distancing and then contact tracing and, and testing was identified and implemented within months, bending the curve in, in many countries, tragically not our own. And uh, trials for vaccines were developed within four months, which is uh, remarkable considering the pace of developing effective treatments that we saw with earlier disease, uh, infectious disease outbreaks such a, well, smallpox, it took uh, only a few thousand years, but even, <laughs> uh, but even um, uh, Ebola, HIV, AIDS, it took um, uh, years to decades before anything with any efficacy was discovered. 
Um, it's, uh, we're well on the way with more than 70 vaccines being tested. None of them is going to be a, a panacea, but um, almost certainly at least one of them is going to, uh, to have uh, considerable efficacy. Mm -hmm. I mean, do you think that people sort of uh, feel this alternative story in their hearts the way that they feel the kind of despair about this year in their hearts? Uh, by alternative story, you mean the uh, development of uh, vaccines and, and hopefully uh, uh, antivirals and other treatments? Yeah, and when I say alternative, maybe that's not the right word because it has a particular baggage to it, but um, a more positive story about the pandemic than we're kind of used to hearing, maybe. Um, possibly. I mean, and it, it is, even for those of us who believe that there has been, a, there is a negativity bias in journalism, the goal isn't to have a, a, an optimism bias. The goal is accuracy. Uh, to, uh, and indeed, it would be a problem if people thought that um, as with, say, the salt polio vaccine in the 50s, a, um, uh, an amazing once in a lifetime, 100, almost 100% 100 effective um, preventive was discovered and we could just go back to life as normal. Probably the, even the best vaccine won't be that good. Um, mm. So we have to be prepared for the, the, uh, the, the likeliest good news, but we do have to be prepared for good news. Mm -hmm. or at least actually, more accurately, we have to hasten the good news. Right, we to, right. We have to, we have to make, make the news good. Right, and, that's, and part of that is that that's possible, that we can hasten the good news. Yes, yeah, so, so uh, an example would be, um, not the only one, but uh, recently I've been encouraging people to uh, sign a petition to the Parliament of Canada to allow challenge trials for uh, COVID vaccines. That is allow altruistic healthy volunteers to be exposed to the coronavirus after having been administered the vaccine in order to find one that works without side effects as uh, quickly as possible. There's some ethical squeamishness about it. I, I think ethically it is completely defensible, indeed I think mandatory, and that's just one example of a measure that an individual can take in the uh, in the effort to do what really ultimately needs to be done, that is to, to find the vaccine. Together, of course, with the measures that we take in our uh, everyday life, like you know, don't, don't hold big parties, don't congregate in bars, wear, wear a mask, uh, and so on. Um, yeah, and you mentioned the negativity bias before in terms of how that plays out in the media and that, you know, of course, we don't want an optimism bias the, the other way. Um, but you have been a proponent of a more of a data driven approach in the media. Um, what have been your thoughts about the pandemic coverage in particular? It's, uh, well, you know, early on, uh, even some of my data oriented friends, cognitive uh, scientists and people influenced by them, uh, may have fallen prey to a bias of their own because there was some downplaying of the uh, virus, uh, the, the um, uh, viral disease in its early days because it hadn't killed that many people yet compared to mm. uh, threats that we live with like uh, influenza and uh, pneumonia. But uh, they may have been subject to the exponential growth bias to throw out a, a bias that could push in the other direction to the availability bias the availability bias being our tendency to be overly influenced by uh, memorable uh, anecdotes and images. But we do tend to underestimate how quickly exponential processes can explode. That's why a lot of people don't save enough for retirement, why they take on too much credit card debt, compound interest being another exponential process. Uh, and the fact that there were only a few hundred deaths in the early days uh, did not mean it ought to have been downplayed then because uh, when things double, the growth can be uh, relentless. And I mm. think they have uh, uh, regretted their words. Um, then, uh, since then, so it, it is serious. It deserves serious coverage. Uh, on the other hand, um, certainly every nuance, everything that can go wrong, can kids transmit it? Can you get it twice? Uh, uh, the, those possibly low probability scenarios that could just terrify people into, into despair uh, ought to be put in perspective. That is, yes, they can happen, but how often, and I think there, there's been some statistical obtuseness in mm -hmm. just um, presenting every biological possibility 
without weighting them by their like their probabilities. Right, right. Um, and you know, in advocating for more of this this data driven approach, you do talk about uh, you know just now you said statistical obtuseness, um, and you've also talked about how statistics are difficult to consume. They're more difficult to digest and remember than sort of um, big splashy events or maybe fears about how you might get the coronavirus from takeout food or something like that. Um, is there a way that this can be reconciled that that we can have this? Uh, approach that looks at the data accurately, but also it plays a role in our psychological comfort? Uh, yes. Um, for, for one thing, statistical literacy should be part of what every educated person commands. And uh, like many social scientists, I think that beginning in, in perhaps in elementary school and, and high school and continuing throughout the educational process, uh, a more statistical kind of consciousness should be instilled. People should know what Bayesian reasoning is. Uh, it's actually not that complicated. They should I don't know, know what Bayesian reasoning is. So. <laughs> Bayesian reasoning is basically, you probably heard the, the expression uh, priors, that that's become more and more common in our everyday uh, discourse. That was, that's borrowed from Bayes theorem, Bayesian reasoning. It simply means you start off with some a priori confidence in a hypothesis. What is your uh, degree of credence before you even look at data? And you adjust it up or down depending on uh, how likely the hypothesis was to uh, generate what you're observing and how likely other hypotheses are to generate what you're observing. So it, it can be explained, particularly if it's explained not in terms of algebra or even probability, but in terms of numbers of concrete cases. Imagine a thousand people, um, only 10 of them have a disease. The false positive rate is uh, uh, one out of every 10. Um, uh, the false negative rate is, say, two out of every 10 a uh, person tests positive, how likely are they to have the disease? It's not that hard when it is properly framed to people, but mm. more generally, it isn't just a matter of pedagogy, although it is that. It's a matter of our sense of what goes into being a responsible, educated adult, and uh, concepts like that should be part of it. They aren't now. Um, I don't know if they still teach trigonometry in high school, but uh, if they do, they should uh, get rid of it to make room for uh, probability and statistics. But also, in, it, it isn't just a question of education, because it also has to be a question of our uh, norms and, and mores and customs in journalism and politics, namely to uh, focus less on headline grabbing flamboyant single events and mm -hmm. more on uh, uh, trends because uh, journalism is biased not in the sense that it's left wing or right wing but just inherently biased in its very nature by reporting events because events usually are things that go wrong. Uh, if a country is at peace, that's not an event. Uh, if a country is democratic, that tends not to be uh, an event. If a city does not have an epidemic, that's not an event. However, if there is a shooting, that is an event. Mm. Uh, and by focusing on events, there's a, almost a built-in bias that there'll be a, um, a, a, a focus toward the, the negative because bad things happen. Uh, whereas good things either consist of nothing happening or things that can creep up over time but that can make accumulate to make a big difference, like the decline in um, extreme poverty, uh, which about, uh, 137,000 people a day escape from extreme poverty, but it isn't a unique thing that happened on the you know a Thursday in October, so there's never a headline. Right. <laughs> like, what's That's the day it. that you decide to report on that is a real question. <laughs> exactly. So it could either take the form of a journalistic um, habit of having more, almost taking a note from the sports pages, which really do present an awful lot of data. Mm. Uh, but uh, it would be crazy if the sports page only reported when your team lost in a blowout, uh, but never reported the ties or the wins or the standings. The business page, people have no trouble following uh, the, the, uh, the, the NASDAQ or the Dow uh, or currency exchange rates or pork belly futures. Uh, the weather, we, we, we follow numbers on, on the weather. The news should, I think, that'd be, have something more like a dashboard where mm -hmm. you actually see the, and, and journalists refer to things like, 
what was the homicide rate uh, last year? Uh, what's the trend in homicide rates? How many are perpetrators? How many victims are of different races, armed versus unarmed? How many police killings are there? Um, and so on for war deaths and terrorist deaths and infectious disease. Uh, if not, uh, I mean, a page with a dashboard would not be a bad idea, but whether or not that page exists, journalists should get into the habit when they report an event like a, uh, a terrorist attack or, or a, a killing. Um, how, uh, it, just because it's gory, does that mean it's part of a trend? Is it really getting better or worse? That should be part of the background to the story. Sure, yeah. I mean, this reminds me of an interview you gave recently on CNN where they're asking you about violence in 2020 and you're pointing out, well, yes, there's been um, you know, a little bit of a spike but if, even if you compare this to recent years, we're, we're still lower. Um, and you also talk about, like, there's a problem with the fact that there's ignorance about progress like this, um, which I think leads to a very real feeling of despair. Um, but people don't know where, where to go to, to get those kinds of numbers. Um, if it's not in the media, you know, where is it? Indeed. Now, and uh, we talked earlier about the website Our World in Data, which is a uh, an astonishing uh, source of uh, information about almost anything you can imagine. Uh, and <clears throat> papers should use or look more like uh, our world in data. And, and it isn't just to make people happier and, uh, and optimistic, uh, although it would, would do that because that's the way so many facts uh, have gone, at least until 2020. Uh, but we should also know when things go wrong. Uh, a lot of people are not aware that there was a big surge in violent crime between the mid-60s and the early 90s, uh, that the homicide rate shot up through the roof before it came down. Um, so people, uh, likewise, I think a lot of people don't know that there was a surge in civil wars starting in the 60s until the uh, end of the Cold War in the 90s. Um, that should be part of our education as well. And it should not just be this war, that story, uh, such and such an anecdote, we really should know which way the world has gone and which way our country has gone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, you know, and you mentioned a couple of things just now that have gone in the, the wrong direction, but something I wanted to ask you, you know, if your Twitter feed is any indication, you, you, do, you do still track the areas that we are making progress in. Um, so I wanted to ask you, you know, uh, between when the book came out and now, what are the major, what, what's the major progress news that people should know about? Um, maybe putting aside 2020 since uh, we talked about how it's, yeah, you know, <laughs> not, not <laughs> heading in the wrong direction. <laughs> not such a good idea. And, and that will happen. Uh, it is, you know, progress is not a magical process. Things do go uh, backwards. Well, the, uh, the, the rate of death in war has continued to decline. It, uh, the, uh, war, the uh, kind of downward roller coaster with, with, a, with a number of upticks uh, which began in 1946, went in the wrong direction with the Syrian civil war starting in 2011, but the, uh, which uh, had a number of uh, uh, people like me who track war deaths worried that we were seeing an, uh, maybe seeing an end to the decline of war. But uh, even though it's still horrific, it is not as horrific as it was uh, three or four years ago. Um, the advance of rights of um, gay people has... Uh, uh, increased more. Uh, se several countries have decriminalized homosexuality. Several countries have abolished um, capital punishment. Uh, child labor has uh, continued to go down. Um, so there are, uh, and um, until this year, where the pandemic uh, puts it in danger, the decline in extreme poverty has uh, continued. The original, one of the sustainable development goals was to eliminate it altogether by 2030. That's not going to happen, but um, that overall trend uh, that most people are unaware of has been continuing until this year. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, 2020 is sort of making the, the point that you made earlier about hastening progress, that just because it puts these things in danger, I mean, if we band together and decide to go in the other direction, that doesn't mean that you know, now we fit 2020 and things are going to go downhill forever. Um, things can go in, you know, uphill again and in a shorter amount of time if we decide that we want to do that as, you know, a collective society. Yes, we have to uh, 
we have to have the mindset that problems are solvable, but we shouldn't just leave them to, to our grandchildren or hope that they work out or enjoy ourselves while we can, because uh, things will uh, deteriorate. Um, nowhere more so than for climate change, which is the, the most wicked problem facing us uh, now. Um, we should not deny it, we shouldn't turn away, but we should look toward solutions. And of course, more immediately, the, the, uh, the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, switching gears a little bit, I, I wanted to ask you about your next book, which I understand is about rationality. And I was just wondering if you give us a little preview of what that's going to be about. Yes, it's a, the uh, tentative subtitle is um, what it is, why it seems scarce, uh, why it matters. Um, it grew out of a course that I taught at Harvard in which I uh, presented the, some of the findings from uh, cognitive psychologists and behavioral economists like Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky and Richard Thaler on uh, typical human fallacies, biases, uh, heuristics, infirmities, errors. Um, the uh, benchmarks of rationality against which we say that humans are irrational, ways of, we talked about some uh, earlier, like Bayesian reasoning, statistical decision theory, distinguishing causation from correlation, uh, logic, uh, informal fallacies. Um, and then also uh, a look at why it seems paradoxically that in an era in which we are blessed with more resources for rationality than ever, big data sets, computational power, uh, why is there so much uh, crack pottery and, and conspiracy theorizing and fake news and alternative facts and quack cures? Uh, how can a species as smart as us be so stupid, apparently? Uh, I think we would all love to know why. I think we would all like to know the answers to that. So um, we, will, we will look forward for the book. Um, Stephen, I think that's all the questions I have. Is there anything um, on your mind that we didn't hit on? I think we've, we've covered a lot and it's been uh, great to be a part of the network and it's been great to talk with you, Emma. Excellent. Thanks so much, Stephen. Thank you.